So uh, the format we decided to try is to have uh, two or three speakers and after that a Q&A and they become a panel. So there are uh, roving microphones. Are there roving microphones? Yo, roving microphones. Yes, there are no. Well, that wasn't the, the plan. Do, do we have microphones that we're we going to row? Well, uh, yeah, there's microphones. They seem to be, I think you're going to, yeah, they're wireless. So. Yes, they are wireless. So uh, we have two volunteers who are going to row. OK. Uh, so you'd like to ask a question? Um, we have a two-minute rule because we have a tight schedule. But unlike most conferences, we're not going to say you have to be the supplicant asking the question of the expert. You have two minutes to give an opinion, tell your experience, and or ask a question. And whatever you say there, we can comment on. I'll start, and then there's a hand back there. Uh, okay. Can I go first? I mean, you want? Okay. Sorry. Okay. I can do both. I can. I'll shuttle after this. It'll be quick. I'm, I won't ramble. I'm. I'm interested in propagation. We all seem to be on the same page. Your all's talks. Uh, yeah. I, I'm thankful for your rhetoric. I, I'm interested in regenerative real estate. Was I think the way Ethan termed it? Uh, what What are the barriers to propagation? I mean, uh, I, I find the heads nodding in kind of the conversations I have and people supporting, you know, ooh, cool, you're an organic farmer, good for you. But actually implementing large scale uh, plantings of this. For example, I'm from Kentucky. The horse pastures there are completely degraded. I drive through the country roads and I think about grazing and um, the mansions on that land are not exactly thrilled at my upstart business. So I'm, I'm curious on the barriers and the possibilities for actually um, moving beyond this being kitsch and actually uh, re regenerating large-scale land. Uh, so I think the Savory Institute's got a great thing started on large-scale propagation around the world. Um, I personally see in the world right now that uh, the thing that is making the most decisions and making the most things run is money, is financial capital. Uh, does that make sense? Do you all see that too? Uh, so I think if that's the case, rather than seeing money as evil and corporations as evil, despite the destruction that's been done, I think there's a real opportunity to learn to use money as a tool, as a powerful tool for doing good. And so the approach that I've taken is to find scalable business models that can accept financial capital, can accept investment capital, uh, and transform it into living capital, doing the regenerative agriculture work, but also create a return for investors. Uh, and so regenerative real estate is one company that's doing that. There are others that are out there. Regenerative real estate focuses on uh, two things. One is purchasing land that's highly degraded. Um, so looking in the arid west of the country where there's a, a kind of sweet spot between actually um, land that's degraded but also enough rainfall that you can get grass to grow and get holistic management grazing going. That's one model. And the other one is a, um, it's called Integral Farm Group. And that actually works with purchasing a cluster of farms and integrating different enterprises on them so that they work together and support each other. The real key in there is not just the functioning of the farms, it's the asset value of the underlying real estate. Uh, so like McDonald's, McDonald's doesn't necessarily, the corporation doesn't make its money on uh, the burger sales. It makes its money because they actually own the land that all the McDonald's sit on. Uh, and so working with the underlying value of real estate and get, using that as a tool to funnel capital into regenerative agriculture is the approach that I'm taking. And just in short, I'd say uh, my experience as a farmer is that it's more economically viable for me. I make more money growing healthy plants than I do growing sick plants. Um, my, my yields are larger. My cost of production is lower. And so it's, I think, you know, it's one thing to invest in land that's available, up for sale, but most land is probably not up for sale at any given point in time. And so working with farmers uh, where they are at, I think it's great that the agribusiness system is basically crashing 
um, I think we're, we're basically wearing out our land to a level where chemicals aren't working anymore, and farmers are either going to go out of business or shift, and, and we're, 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 I think we're nearing that point. Um, it's, it's very exciting. I mean, just we're, the soil is really dead, and chemicals don't work anymore. And, you know, the only way is through building soil. It's, 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 we're, we're, being forced, we're being forced to this point. It's not a choice anymore. Um, it's quite exciting, yeah. But money, again, I think money does actually, you know, push the, push the issue. Again, the Maslow's priority of needs, right? We need to basic income. That's, that's, that's what drives people. Um, and if they can make a better quality of life doing the right thing, um, that's, that's for me where it is. I would just like to add that uh, Alan Savory talks about um, not total rainfall, but effective rainfall. That is, rainfall that goes into healthy soils sinks in. So even if you don't get much rain, if it goes straight into the ground, it's doing a lot of good. And even if you get a lot of rain, if it just evaporates and runs off into flash floods, then it's not. So one of the keys is that, that uh, Ethan was talking about was the absorbability of the soil. Um, who, who's calling on, on whom? Uh, you're next. Uh, hi. I, uh in, I, I develop low energy buildings. One of the aspects of them, you know, besides the energy stuff, is to have local urban agriculture, greenhouses, and so forth. And one of the uh, selling points of that is the uh, fact that the nutritional components, particularly micronutrients, decline very rapidly after picking. And so I'm trying to develop a concept of fresh killed plants that get uh, uh, eaten immediately, and I am uncertain about the science behind that. Um, micronutrients getting killed. Uh, my, I'm pretty sure that you know once an element is in the peach, it's still in the peach. Uh, the question is how fast do the compounds break down? Um, are things being picked ripe? Um, it sounds like a bit of a convoluted question to go into in short order. I'm not sure. Is there something specific you want to address, or? Well, I'm just, you know, looking at data which says various plants that, uh, for greens, for example, within 24 hours, there's a 60% decline in micronutrients. Uh, I mean, they, how do you define micronutrients? I don't know the literature that, that well, but they, they take various vitamins as, um, proxies for general decline. And then this other research which shows that particularly the anti-carcinogenic micronutrients disappear very quickly. And it differs from plant to plant. So there's compounds and there's elements. I don't think compounds, the elements are probably yes, leaving. Compounds. The, the compounds do break down depending on, um, there's just, uh, people have heard ethylene gas perhaps. Ethylene is, gas is sprayed um, into a truck full of green tomatoes to make them turn red as part of their, you know, breakdown process. Um, plants that have good levels of higher order compounds functionally will sit ripe on, your sh on, the, on the counter for a month and, um, and not lose a lot of their, a lot of their uh, nutritional value. So, I mean, the, the, the nuance, the complexity, the, the sophistication of nutrition and what it is is a really interesting proposition. Um, we're doing our best with our organization to, to be rigorous about it and study these things um, it's a, it's a, that's a long conversation. Um. Uh, hey, Dan, Ethan, uh, really exciting talks. Um, I'm Jeff Wallen, the founder of the Biochar Company, which is an umbrella company of a bunch of the early biochar pioneers all gathered under one company. Uh, we're one of the 11 Virgin Earth Challenge finalists. Uh, so naturally, my questions about biochar. Uh, I, I see that it's part of the carbon farming course, which I'm really excited to learn more about, Ethan. But Dan, I'm curious uh, if you're doing anything with it uh, still in, in your own farming practices or, or in your teachings. Uh, yeah, biochar. Um, I think biochar is especially appropriate in areas uh, here, like, like here in New England, where you've got a lot of um, uh, you know, forests that have been, they're basically grown up from scrub and are over, 
um, grown. They're too thick. There's a lot of a lot of trees that are weak. Um, you know, I'm not sure how appropriate it is for broad scale application in the Midwest. Um, but I think in certain environmental climates, it's extremely valuable and appropriate. Um, it's one of the tools in the toolbox, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's a number of tools. We have all the tools. We have all the science. We simply don't have the, um, the, the, know, -how, the, the, the know how in the larger populace, is my understanding. I, I like to say I, I grew up in the organic community, and I, you know, um, you know, pretty close to going to all the conferences. And there's so much that I've learned in the past few years that I never heard in 20 years of organic conferences. Um, I just really think that 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 uh, the access to the good information is is one of our major limiting factors, and yeah, certainly biochar is a tool in the toolbox. Um, um, yeah, I'm not going to respond at all to that because you didn't ask me a question, but I just do want to pick up on that again because, and also that question before about propagation, because I think in a way that's a lot of what this conference is. There's a lot of people here who have some of the pieces together, and it is about how do we scale and get effective quickly. And so I think Dan just pointed to this other really important piece of education. And so I see education of having the function of swelling the, like the foundational pool of people who have enough information. And then really beyond that, I, I think that the other piece is about entrepreneurship. I, I have one idea that's really good and working well, but I think that after people take the carbon farming course, take some of Dan's courses, you know, get some of this education, then there's another step to take the concepts and ground them into entrepreneurial ideas. So I think there's a, a vast collaboration needed with the huge realm of social entrepreneurs who are out there who are doing great social work to connect that to eco and agricultural entrepreneurs. I think that's a link that's missing a little bit. Thank you. And just even finally, you know, we have this infrastructure of education. We have universities. We've got land grants. Um, a lot of this information is simply not being propagated through the, the, the current modes of education. And uh, there's the there's the you know the what do you want to call them the the, the fringe, um, whether it's organic or biodynamic or permaculture or, or whatever it is, you know, who don't necessarily learn from the from the land grants, but the vast majority of farmers who, you know, farming the vast majority of land learn what they learn through that formal infrastructure. And so um, I think, you know, figuring out ways to get this kind of information propagated through that larger uh, inf system is, is going to be critical. What's being done right now with, with cover cropping uh, through the formal infrastructure in this country is very impressive and, and really, really positive. So it's happening, but really figuring out ways to get the information into modes that is safe and accepted and, and, and disseminated broadly is a major objective, I would suggest. Um, I just want to um, say we've, we've, we're catching up on our time. We started a little late. And the way we've structured the Q&A and the breaks is that if the Q&A goes over and people want to keep having that conversation, anybody who wants to go on a break is free to do so, but we can extend the Q&A. So um, we have another, uh, theoretically, and we can run a little late if people don't mind, um, we have theoretically another five minutes of the break. We are that far into the break. So um, if people want to keep asking questions, it's fine, and we'll extend the break by another 10 minutes. So, can I uh, mention something that may get people interested in how we uh, get more people interested in this idea? I've been saying for the last several years that I think autism is the new scurvy or rickets. So <laughs> if we need 56 elements to regenerate our bodies and we have all of these kids with brain damage from an incomplete diet, if we can figure out which element or elements are missing, we're going to have a whole lot of really interested people. I think mothers are the central. Um, I'm not. I'm a father, so I think fathers are important too. But you get a mother, and poof, yeah. No, human health. You know, health of your family is is central, and it's not just the minerals; it's the biology. You know, anybody who's taking antibiotics, you're giving antibiotics to their kids. You screw up that gut flora, and you're and you're working from behind. So it's the microbes and the minerals, um, certainly. Um, but I like to think that the whole pharmaceutical industry um, could be putting their energy into growing pharmaceutical-grade food. Um, 
who was that guy? Uh, um, Hippocrates, anybody heard of Hippocrates? <laughs> and with Hippocratic Oath, what is it? First, do no harm, then let food be your medicine. It's real simple, right? It's real simple, and it works, and it's true. And if you actually do eat good food, it will cure you, it will heal you. Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, let's engage the pharmaceutical industry. Let's, let's, let's put them out of business by growing so much good food that people are healthy enough to not need them in the first place, or give them lots of business by, you know, bringing them together in this conversation about, you know, healing and, and nutritional deficiencies and uh, all that kind of stuff. I think it's really quite exciting how, you know, the opportunity to really turn this whole thing around. We'll see how it plays, but it's certainly lots of opportunity. Cool. Hello. Um, you were mentioning like this important nexus of social entrepreneurship and regenerative agriculture. And I'm curious if there are networks or organizations or just case study examples that you know of where a bunch of entrepreneurs and farmers who have this regenerative agriculture kind of bent to them are being connected with each other. Uh, I'd say the National Young Farmers Coalition is uh, pretty much the best place to start because most farmers do end up being entrepreneurs. It's just part of being a <laughs> farmer currently. So that's one of the places I've yeah. seen it a lot. I've seen it more from the agriculture, permaculture, regenerative agriculture side go going towards entrepreneurship than from the social entrepreneurship going towards mm. agriculture. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of the existing social entrepreneurship organizations are doing a great job at pivoting and including agriculture and food systems in their work. So Echoing Green and Ashoka and Starting Block and a lot of those folks are doing awesome work. We just need more and more and they need more funding and support and farmers need more funding and support. Uh, so uh, all that kind of points back to what I said originally, which is having viable business models that can incentivize capital coming out of the destructive system and heading into the regenerative system, that's what we need. Cool. Thanks. Okay, let's take one more. Uh, my name is uh, Barney Brower. I'm a school educator. I'm a retired school principal. I'm wondering whether the regenerative agriculture work, including the financial parts of it, um, are there places in New England that are doing it? Um, our work is to try and figure out which parts of that can eight-year-olds understand and which parts of it do you, can 12 year and so on. Eight-year-olds can understand all of it better than we can, <laughs> usually. <laughs> um, I'd point to uh, uh, Greenfield Community College in Greenfield, Mass. has a great food systems program that's doing really excellent education. Um, and I believe doing some work with school, a school you know, uh, earlier school. Um, I know in the Rondout Valley where I live in New York, the high school has actually just implemented a whole agriculture curriculum. That's just a whole track that they can do in high school. So that's a place to look. Um, but I, it's not exactly my field. I'd go to um, Greenfield Community College and get in touch with their food systems coordinator. I'm sure that she knows a whole bunch of excellent places it's happening. Yeah, go for it. Eight-year-olds will do it much better than we can do it. Okay, well, why don't we take 10 minutes and try to be back in, in you know, the actual 10 minutes. And thank you to Dan and to Ethan.